Good afternoon and welcome to anybody who may be watching uh, during our recorded session. Uh, welcome to another NICER National Institute for Congestion Reduction webinar series. It is my, my name is Stephanie Lewis and I will serve as your moderator today. It is my pleasure to introduce our three presenters. A, their full, bio, their full bios are provided on the NICER website, so but I will just take a couple seconds uh, to introduce each of them to you today. Um, our first presenter today will be Ms. Debbie Albert. She is a traffic engineer with over 20 years experience. Um, Ms. Albert supports Texas DOT, regional and local jurisdictions on access enhancements and ro roadway construction. Uh, projects and assets with transportation operation projects for Texas A&M um, University. Again, full bios are available on the NICER website. Our second, our next presenter will be Kartik Jha, um, has served in, uh, has been involved in topical research in the areas of urban mobility measurement, roadway travel reliability, freight mobility, traffic operations, and special event traffic management uh, for eight years at TTI uh, at Texas A&M Institute. And then finally, we have Mah uh, Maheen Ramazani. Uh, she is a research data scientist in the Center for Transportation Safety at Texas A&M Transportation Institute. Uh, with that being said, um, Debbie, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to you. All right, great. I think you probably all can hear me now. Um, thank you, Stephanie, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Again, I'm Debbie Albert, and I'm going to run through um, initially the background related to study, and then I'm going to pass it off to Maheen uh, and Kardik, who will share the methodology and give an update on the results of this research. So the purpose of this study is to look at newly available crowdsourced data sets to see what they can tell us about traffic flow, safety, and economic effects of access management projects. We specifically looked at data from two locations in Texas. The first one is FM 2347 or George Bush Drive in the Bryan College Station area. And the second is RM620 in Lakeway, which is just west of Austin. So those are the two stars that are on the map. These sites were selected because of the timing of the improvements. The new data sets are generally only have data backed or available back to the beginning of 2019. And we wanted to avoid obviously using 2020 data because of all of the COVID anomalies. So in order to get you know, some before and after information, we had to find projects that were completed in 2020 or by early 2021 at the very latest. The George Bush Drive project shown here included installation of raised medians in February and March of 2021. And although the construction of the project actually covered an air, a larger area, uh, mostly to the east, this analysis focused on a 0.3 or three tenths of a mile segment where there was some commercial development um, within the project limits. The RM620 project is a high volume arterial where concrete um, block raised medians were installed on a one and a half mile section of roadway in late summer, early fall 2020. The businesses in this uh, project are scattered along the entire stretch of roadway, but the retail and commercial is concentrated more heavily on the west or south side of the project. So to your left in this picture. Before we get into the methodology and the results in the analysis, I uh, wanted to quickly cover the why. So why, why do we want to do this analysis or conduct this analysis? Access management can be a hot button topic between the engineering community and developers, business owners, or property owners along transportation corridors. Elected officials and decision makers tend to often get caught in the middle between the engineers citing a whole plethora of safety and mobility statistics and studies and the community members who feel that they're being negatively affected. They can usually agree that traffic congestion or safety is an issue in the area and something should be done about it, but they're not always on the same page when it comes to the solutions. There is a huge cost to build or expand roadways and nobody wants to pay more taxes or fees to foot the bill for this construction. So if we can just be more efficient with what we have and smooth traffic flows, everybody wins. Many of the tools or practices used to help smooth out traffic are considered access management and are listed here. As I mentioned previously, we specifically looked at installation of new medians to see how and if these new data sources can be used to assess their effectiveness. 
Enhanced safety is a high priority for everyone. Research points to reducing the number of conflict points as a, an effective way to improve safety. Various access management techniques help achieve that reduction. In the case of the median example shown here, there are 11 conflict points in the graphic on the left, which has full access or direct left turns in and out of the side streets versus the six on the right where you have maybe a directional um, access available. But it takes years to gather the information about safety because crashes are random. You want to evaluate a minimum of three years of before and after data and realistically you need five. Decision makers can't wait five years to respond to constituent concerns. So is there something out there in this new data that can be um, used to help speed up the process and the analysis? Keeping people moving is another goal of access management techniques. For the customers, less congestion and more reliable travel means people reserve their time for what they want to do, spending time with family, shopping, eating out, just plain having fun. A common concern voiced is that drivers bypass businesses on roads with medians because it's too difficult to get there without direct access. On the other hand, a lot of people say, you know, the Yogi Berra quote, nobody goes there anymore because it's too crowded. So another goal of this study was to see if the crowdsourced data could be used to assess turning movements before and after the medians were installed to see how traffic patterns changed. Although it's not a direct link to sales, understanding turning rates can identify if people are still going to the, business, same, the businesses at the same rates and how much those trips have changed um, location or how they're being made. Finally, efficiencies gained via uh, less slowdowns and more reliable travel times to destinations means consumers have more time to shop and they may even be more likely to enjoy getting to the store. A land use and transportation study found that 30% reduction in travel speed can lead to a loss of over 50% of the market area for a business. So if average speeds are 40 miles an hour and they drop to just below 30 miles an hour, businesses could expect to draw customers from an area of 45% their original size. More efficient access and fewer slowdowns means more predictable travel times for the customers. And this also has an impact on shipping. Um, so there's fewer shipment delivery disruptions. Traffic, traffic backups play a huge role in their shipping costs and reliability, which is critical given to the just-in-time economy we are living in now. In the past, studies in Texas and in other states have looked at measuring business impacts by doing surveys, and more recently, looking at sales tax and property value, value information. Through this project, we wanted to explore other points of interest data or business data to assess opportunities for using it to conduct access management project evaluations. We are completing six different analyses to explore the data as part of the project, mostly using data from August through November 2019 as the before condition, and then August to November of 2021 as the after condition. Four of the six involve new crowdsource data, those are shown in black while the other two involve traditional data sources. Mahin is gonna talk more about the Ouija data, the first three bullets in black, but first I'll provide you some background on the traditional sources and safe graph spend data. When looking at the crash data, crash rates for each corridor were calculated using five years of before collision data from the TxDOT crash reporting system, and then as much data as we could access for the after condition. We do recognize that we are well short of the five-year mark and that can skew the results at this time. Sales tax data were collected from the state comptroller's office for the four months before and four months after period. We want a little bit more detail about safe graph. So when we initially, um, the safe graph spend data, when we initially scoped the project, we anticipated looking at safe graph point of interest data that measures footfalls or connected device sightings within a business, business building footprint. The idea was that if we could assess and measure the number of sightings before and after the medians were installed, and that could be somehow correlated to the business transactions. There has been a change in how the data is packaged, so it was not as readily available as originally anticipated. However, SafeGraph has offered up a different data set, SPEND, that we may feel may be even more beneficial. The spend data looks at debit and credit card transactions aggregated on a monthly basis to individual places in the U.S. going back to January 2019. While we don't have any results to show you yet today, we hope that the data have the data in the coming weeks to include the assessment in the final report when it gets published. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Mahin now to provide some background on the Ouija data sets and the methodology you use to be able to analyze that data. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mahin, and today I want to talk about video connected vehicle data. To begin, I would like to show you this simple graphic which contains about 120 million data points captured in Texas during a one hour period on November 5th, 2021. Here you can see that we have the data point all over the, all across the state. And this tells us that this data is not only for the urban area. Video data pre uh, provide us a data point for each vehicle movement every three seconds. And this contains location, time, speed, and other attributes that I will explain more about them later. It also contains important events such as heartbreaking and heart acceleration. For this project, we use eight months of this data, August through November 2019, which collected by one OEM, and August through November 2021, which were collected by four OEMs. As Debbie mentioned, we specifically look at the data from uh, two location in Texas, the George Bush Drive and the RM620. Uh, uh, and for each of these, uh, as you can see in the picture, we create a polygon in ArcGIS and then use the geospatial join to filter our data and only capture the data for this specific area. Now, this is a lot of data. For example, for George Bush Drive, we have more than half a million uh, of journeys. And for RM620, we have more, uh, around 1 million uh, uh, journeys. Uh, but let's look at, uh, this, look, at, look at this data in a, a small scale. For example, what it would look like if it only be one trip? In this slide, I'm going to show you one a video that is uh, showing us one journey pass. Uh, Stephanie, can you please play the video for us? Thank you. Okay, as you can see, this is this uh, trip is a start from George Bush Drive. The driver goes to a property number one, which is a McDonald's uh, store in George Bush Drive, goes to drive through, wait for his order, and then continue his journey. This trip was roughly took 45 minutes, and it contains more than 850 um, points of data. These data points collected every three seconds along this path. Uh, you can see the detail of this trip. And if you look at the uh, color of this point, you can see three different color. These represent the speed of our trip, uh, which red is a, a slow, uh, a uh, speed and green shows the fastest speed. Thank you, Stephanie. You can close it now. Now let's talk about the attribute that video provide for us uh, and what we can get from these attributes. The attribute that we use from video data are location, time, speed, heading, and engine status, which can be on, off, or mid-journey. The first information that we could capture from this attribute was traffic volume. In this slide, you can see a segment of uh, a George Bush Drive, which is near the property number one again. You can see in this red area that um, are shown in picture in the left side. These are the uh, all of the traffic and trip that are happening around this area. The middle picture shows one journey that go inbound to the uh, property number one. And the last one shows one journey that go outbound of that. 
the next information that we can get from these attributes of visual data are journey paths. The journey paths can be captured for all journey together or um, can be filtered based on the criteria that we have. For example, let's say we only want to get the journey that visit a, a specific property. And I should mention that journey start when the ignition of the vehicle is on and it will end when the ignition is off. In this slide, I will uh, you can see all the journey for the George Bush Drive. Uh, these are the same picture that I showed you before. But what if if we only want to see the those journey who visit a property? This is how it it would look like. You can see in this picture. In the right side of the slide, you can see the smaller number of the journey, uh, but these are only the journeys that visit property number two, three, and four in our map. And the last thing that I want to show you uh, is the turning movement that we could easily capture from the data that we have. It would, it can be the left turn, right turn or U-turns. This picture shows a crossover uh, in George Bush Drive. You can, in, in this picture, actually, you can see all of the journeys that happening during these eight months of data that we have. You can see in the crossover, some people are trying to do the turning movement. But if we only consider one of these journey, as you can see in this picture, uh, this is a left turn into one property. Um, again, you can see a color code here. It starts start with green. And then when the vehicle uh, want to do the left turn maneuver, uh, the speed will decrease. And then after the maneuver, it increase again. The way that we capture this journey, uh, the, this turning movement, is using the heading and uh, the heading time and the location. When a turning movement happens, the heading of the vehicle will change. For left and right turn, in most of the cases, we have around 90 degrees of uh, heading change, and the for and for U turn, we have around 180 degrees of heading change. The turning movement usually takes a few seconds and it should happen in a same crossover and like in a closed area. And now with that, I will turn it over to Carty to talk about the result that we got from this data. Thank you, Mahin. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone can hear me properly. Um, so now we'll start to look over some of the results of this analysis. Shown here are the number of journeys recorded for the George Bush Drive study area and the percentage of hard braking and hard accelerations observed. Again, the 2019 data is the before condition, just to reiterate, and is the darker of the colors here. 2019, 2021 is the after and is the lighter color. We look at some of the previous graphs in more details in the next couple of graphs. It shows the number of, uh, this one here shows the number of video journeys observed during the two four month analysis periods. As we saw, there was minimal change, which was within plus minus 5% from 2019 to 2021. This is somewhat unexpected since the 2019, uh, since the 2021 data included more manufacturers, more OEMs. So you would expect more samples. The negligible change could be an after effect of COVID-19 and the overall average daily traffic still being lower. This graph includes hard acceleration and breaking event ratios based on the number of events reported relative to the total journeys in the study area. In each month, there was between a 50 to 100% increase in the ratio from 2019 to 2021. The hope was to be able to use this information as a stand-in or a leading indicator for safety effects. However, after diving into the data, we found that 
the different manufa vehicle manufacturers classify hard braking and hard acceleration at different threshold values. The 2019 video data set included only one manufacturer, while there were four in 2021. The data set does not include the value for these, event for these events. It just indicates that an event occurred. Therefore, it is impractical at this point to assess if there was truly an increase or decrease in the event ratios. Further, there are on ongoing investigations into the relationship between hard braking and crash frequency and severity. If the relationships are established, this data could be used to provide early safety results, but only if data from a single manufacturer is analyzed or a common, th or a common threshold is used by all manufacturers to define events. The same data was evaluated for RM620. You can see the results here. Similar observations to that that we saw at George Bush Drive location, but here the number of journeys in the study area were down 10 to 12 percent depending on the month, and the hard acceleration and braking ratios increased in the range of 52 to 116 percent. The journey information is also available by day, which is very helpful. This can be helpful for several reasons. First, you can do some sort of a sniff test and uh, see if the journey's frequencies follow anticipated uh, levels. For example, weekend numbers are lower than Monday through Friday, which can be anticipated. Also, you can pull out events or activities that might drive the journey numbers higher. For example, George Bush Drive, George Bush Drive borders the largest university in Texas, the Texas a and University. So as you anticipate, as you might anticipate, football game days have higher recorded journeys. Summer and Thanksgiving break are quite a bit lower than typical week weekdays. Finally, you can compare time periods to see if there is anything that might affect other business metrics like sales or number of customers. For example, in 2019, there were two football events in October, as you can see in the highlighted box here. In 2021, though, there were three football events. For your information, September and November each had two games, both in 2019 and 2021. But in 2019, there was also a Thursday night game in August. In the next few slides, we'll go through the journey type and turning movement results using examples from four different property areas along George Bush Drive to give you a flavor of the type of information available and how it applies to different scenarios. These four different areas are highlighted here in this figure. The rates shown in the yellow on this figure on the left are the frequency of the respective journey type for that property compared to all journeys on the main roadway. For this property in particular, there is no change in median access. So this was used as a control point. Median construction was on the other side, which is the east side of Welburn Road, which is an intersection, intersecting street from George Street. So this one is a fast food restaurant land use. As Mahin alluded to earlier, this is actually a McDonald's. Midpoint journeys are four to six times the ignition on and ignition off journeys, which makes sense given the type of business and people using the drive through The slight increase in mid journeys from 2019 to 2020, 21, could be attributed to how people receive service at fast food restaurants post COVID-19. As you can see, there are more pickups and drive throughs than dine-ins in your own personal experience. The increase might be more than what we think since the on and off types went down. So the delta or the change is more like 0.6% instead of 0.3%. Property two is a retail land use and is considered a destination business. Key off journeys and turning ratios are shown on the left. Recall, this is the number of turning vehicles compared to the overall number of vehicles going in the same direction on the street. Note that in some cases, the driveways are closely spaced or not clearly defined. So for those cases, the turning movements have been combined. For example, two right turns from George Bush Drive and the rights and the left from Highland Street. Key of events increased from 0.8% of journeys on George Bush Drive to 1.4%, to as you can see on the figure a 75% increase. There was a change in access. Left turns to and from Highland Street were removed. Vehicles using that left turn access appear to have selected alternative access. Alternative access. 
These alternative paths are clearly shown in the journey heat maps on the right as well. Option one is you make a U-turn at Wellborn Road and then a right turn into the business. Option two for a vehicle is to make a left turn in advance of the property at Montclair Avenue, a street which is to the east of the property, and then travel through the parcel to the east of property two. The last option, option three, comes from the south. You come from the south, this is reflected in actually the left turning ratio from Highland Street uh, that you can see over here, which nearly doubled from 2.7% to 5.3%. This slide, this slide illustrates the data when looking at a parcel that has multiple businesses, including retail, restaurant, and office land uses. Four out of the seven businesses are the same in the before and after time windows, which is great. Overall journeys to and from the property went down by nearly 1%. It is unclear if the change in journeys was a result of the medians or if the change in business types and their trip generation caused this reduction. Based on the heat maps shown on the right, there are fewer journeys to and from the area west of Welburn Road. And you can see there are fewer journeys recorded going west, westbound in front of the businesses, likely a result of fewer people turning left into the parking lots or onto Highland Street. This is the fourth and final property analyzed along George Bush Drive. For this example, we looked at the rates for ignition or key on events. This property is the gas station. Trips back to residential southwest area of the project corridor disappeared. As shown on the right, there was a grocery store with gas pumps constructed during the project timeline which likely contributed to the change in turning moment rates. The second study uh, corridor, RM620, was divided into five segments and turning moment rates were generated for each of them. We will discuss one individual property in segment five for illustrative purposes. And this is that property. This property is a grocery store and did not have any changes in allowable inbound turning movements. The turning movement rates increased or stayed the same along RM620, but decreased along Main Street and Medical Drive. Unsure if the additional vehicles turning onto RM620 are cutting through or going to other businesses, these changes in turning rates are good for engineers and planners to know to help better design future projects. But when looking at business impacts, it would be better to have the key on, key off, and mid journey data to know if there was an increase or decrease in customers. Crash data were also analyzed at the two study locations using the text.crash reporting information system, the Chris database. We observed a decrease in crash, data, crash rates at the RM620 location, which is the, which is the two um, bars on the top, but an increase at the George Bush Drive location, which is the two bars at the bottom. Our assessment is that we might need a larger sample size thereby a longer after duration of observation to arrive at a meaningful finding from the crash data. There might also be an overrepresentation of crashes occurring at the Wellborn and George Bush Drive location, the intersection, which is something that we are examining further. Sales tax data was requested from the Texas State Comptroller for, for the two study locations. The Comptroller's office provided a list of all taxpayers within the requested limits, the taxpayer, the taxpayers, in other words, the businesses, were selected to include in the analysis, and the controller provided an aggregated monthly total. The controller's office reports data based on the allocation month to accurately re reflect the, num the month the taxes were collected in. The reporting period was shifted forward two months. We discussed some of the important takeaways from analyzing this data in the next couple of slides. For both the George Bush and RM620 locations, we noticed an increase in the September collections. One thing to note here is that several of the taxpayers actually changed from the before to after months. This was more noticeable along the George Bush Drive corridor as there were far fewer taxpayers in total to start with at this location. Now we look at some of the important findings from analyzing the sales tax data at both these locations. The sales tax data showed increases in sales tax revenue in seven out of eight observations with percent changes from year to year ranging from an increase of 127% to a decrease of 30%. These changes are too large to be caused by change in access 
and are likely caused by other issues in the data, making the data poorly suited for this kind of examination. The first issue with the data is that it was collected during the pandemic when many businesses failed, unfortunately. During this time period, two out of two 12 businesses on George Bush closed and two new businesses opened. This included the closing of two restaurants and the opening of a grocery store and attached express center. These types of businesses will produce dramatically different sales tax revenue. On RM620, 19 out of 105 businesses closed with 18 new businesses opening. These types of businesses that both closed and opened vary from restaurants to dry cleaners to pool and plumbing services. This makes it difficult to compare the time periods since the two periods don't share the same businesses. This could be mitigated by comparing only those businesses that appear in both data for both years, in both data sets for both years. However, the dollar amounts are reported as an aggregate number to maintain anonymity. It may be possible in the future to take the analysis a step further and make a second request to the comptroller's office requesting only the condensed list of taxpayers. These results may vary depending on the type of businesses excluded. The second issue with the data is that businesses have different tax reporting schedules. Some report the revenues monthly, others bi-monthly, some others quarterly, while some report monthly but in, but in an inconsistent manner. This makes comparing monthly changes difficult since any business may not report tax revenues in the same month each year. This could be mitigated by removing businesses that report inconsistently or by expanding the period of time covered by the data. One possible solution could be to survey the businesses as to their sales tax reporting behavior and patterns. This would allow for a more tailored analysis. The third issue with the data is inflation. Inflation as measured by the Consumer Price Index, CPI, was about 8.3% from August 2019 to November 2021. Several months of data showed a 6 to 7% increase in revenues, which would, be an, which would actually be a decrease in revenue if inflation was considered. The data could be adjusted for inflation, but it may not be appropriate to adjust revenues for local businesses using the national CPI. The limited number of observations also presents a challenge. Revenues from a single month could be heavily impacted by one-time events. For example, a few days of bad weather in one month could have a large impact on revenues. This could be mitigated by having, one, uh, having more observations or increasing the coverage period of the data collected. If we were to examine a year of data before and a year of data after, there might be a way to account for some of the seasonality and different reporting timeframes. If all of these issues were accounted for, then this type of data could potentially be used to show an impact. To conclude, this crowdsourced data type provides valuable information on travel patterns along access managed corridors. The same information if sought through, uh, if sought through manual data collection will be expensive, time consuming and relatively unscalable. As we saw with the sales tax data analysis, the available public information doesn't seem to be granular, granular enough to derive conclusive insights on impacts of access management. A couple of other observations as far as the video data goes, using the same or a single OEM or a manufa vehicle manufacturer for both the before and after periods can be comparatively more useful in providing insights on events like heartbreaking and evaluating accompanying safety impacts. We also observed that in its current form, with this data, it is infeasible to associate movements with events. For example, it is hard to tell if a certain movement type has more or fewer heartbreaking events than another movement type. However, having said all this, this, this evaluation of crowdsourced data, such as the video data, revealed that different elements of this data set can be useful for different sets of audience. For example, Detailed information on vehicle journeys can be useful for businesses, property owners, and elected officials, while elements such as vehicle trajectories or paths, turning rates, and events like heartbreaking and acceleration can be useful information for engineers and planners. We have also noted some ideas for future um, potential future evaluation using these data sets. As we alluded to earlier in the presentation, Research is underway to investigate the correlation between heartbreaking events and safety or crash outcomes. Also, because cross-source data captures a sample of the overall traffic, a factor to scale up 
to determine the number of daily trips can be useful, particularly to road, road designers. Another possible evaluation is where one could look at hotspot identification using data for events such as hard braking and hard acceleration. Lastly, the correlation between turning movements and spend data, which Debbie spoke about earlier, can be very revealing, can be pretty revealing in terms of uh, traveler movements to and from businesses. On behalf of my team at TTI, I thank you for your time and patience. Happy to take questions now, and we can also be reached out at the contacts provided if you'd like a follow-up conversation later. Thank you again. Back to you, Stephanie. Thank you so much for um, the great information, the presentation, and all of that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to um, open up. Um, oops, that's the wrong one. Sorry about that. I'm actually going to open up um, the 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 feed so that you can actually see our three uh, presenters today by just simply clicking that um, video symbol at the top of the screen. Uh, I'm also going to, hi Debbie, I see you. Um, I'm also going to remind everybody um, how to ask a question. You have access to uh, the Q&A box, which is located on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in any questions and or comments you have, um, and we'll just sort of read through those and I'll moderate any questions um, that come in. So it looks like we already have a number of questions um, submitted. Um, in the box. So we'll start with the first one. Um, it says, what program uh, or process did you use to map the journeys shown in the examples? I can answer this question. Go for it. Uh, we use actually two, we, we did the two way to demonstrate the data. The first one is Kepler, which is a Python module. And we use that when we had a smaller data, for example, if we had only one trip, uh, we use Kepler. Uh, the advantage of Kepler is it has more detail. It can show all the uh, point of the data uh, with any kind of detail that we want. For example, the way that we use the color to show the speed along the journey. But the disadvantage is that the volume of data is uh, bigger. It cannot work. For those cases, we use data shader. Data shader is more like a heat map and shows the data with brightness. Uh, the more, more bright area means more data points are available in those area. Um, yeah, these are the two um, Python library that we use to demonstrate our data. Great, thank you so much. Um, so the next question comes in, it says, uh, personal data security and privacy are a hot topic. What did TTI take uh, to make sure personal information isn't shared? Uh, I can answer that one as well. Uh, that's really a good, very good question. The data that we get from Vijo are already anonymized, uh, so there is no personal information in that. Uh, we didn't take any action ourselves because the data that we are getting is the, the video are uh, already take took care of it. Uh, for example, another thing that uh, is important to remember is uh, this data is only aggregated data for each journey separately and uh, journey start, as I mentioned before, from ignition off to ignition, ignition on to ignition off. And there is no way for us to link this journey together uh, and track them, um, for example, track one vehicle uh, for all of the journey that it has uh, during um, a specific of time, uh, amount of time. Also, the identifier ID for event table and journey table are uh, completely separate, and there is no way to, for us to link these um, events, for example, heartbreak and heart acceleration to journey movements. Okay. Um, it says, based on your analysis, uh, do you feel that this data is ready uh, for use in conducting before and after analysis on access management projects? I, I can start with that one then, Kartik, if you or Fahim want to jump in and add anything. Um, I think, yes, overall, the, the data is ready for um, and can tell um, quite, quite a story as far as, um, 
you know, access to and from, particularly speaking on the Ouija data, since we don't have the spend information yet to, um, to be able to talk directly about it. Uh, I mean, I think there's just a couple of things. One, um, you need to make sure that when you're deciding to do this, you need to decide early on in the project or before the project is complete that you want um, you want to do this analysis so that that way you can make sure that all of the data that you um, want or need is going to be available to you. Uh, two, you know, it's, it is not a plug and play um, set of data. So it's not like you'll be able to go to a web interface and it's going to have all of these um, details calculated for you. As Mahin has talked about um, just a second ago, there, there's quite a bit of an analysis that needs to go on and having a data scientist available um, is certainly a must at this point, um, but that may change in the future as it becomes more readily available. Um, and then I think, um, you know, just some of those things that we noted earlier in the presentation about, um, you know, using one OEM for if you're going to be looking at the heartbreaking or heart acceleration events, um, I think having the ignition on and ignition off um, analysis done, as opposed to just during the turning movements at driveways, certainly helps uh, tell more of a story. Um, you may or may not be able to get the data to be as granular, just as we showed in those four examples along George Bush Drive. Three of the properties had a single business in there, so you could, um, you know, get glean a lot more information as opposed to if you're doing it for a strip center, um, you may not be able to associate or be able to say, okay, yes, this this business is getting the same amount of traffic as it did before. Um, because if you don't have a single business, you know, you won't be able to um, provide that that kind of assessment. So I don't know if Kardik, if you had anything else you wanted to add to that. Yeah, uh, you covered most of it, Debbie. Uh, I'll just add that, you know, uh, it has use cases, different seg different elements of this data have different use cases as we, you know, discussed in brief in the presentation for engineers and planners and, you know, elected officials in the public and the businesses. Uh, uh, we just hope that this data evolves a little bit so that even some of the, you know, the future potential feedback, uh, the evaluation ideas we spoke about, those things, if we, for example, if we are able to correlate uh, you know, events with movements, you know, let's say with in the video data, that might be something that might be even more interesting. Uh, for, um, even more so, you know, for, for example, uh, if you are able to correlate, if you are able to, let's say, you know, correlate sales tax data or the spend data that we are hoping to get and analyze uh, with turning movements, that's something that, you know, property owners or business uh, businesses might be more interested in. So it has some use cases and applications for sure in 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 in, in its current current form, but there are also some you know uh, prospects for you know improvement uh, in the future, which I'm sure will happen just because the evolu evolving nature of these kinds of data sets. So yeah, it's in the works. I I'm sure somewhere. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, do you have any um, next steps uh, for the data or any uh, future research plans that you would like to share? Um, not at this point. I know, you know, not for this specific application. I know Maheen is um, continuously involved with throughout TTI um, using this data and looking at it. Um, we've got some stuff that we've done in West Texas, um, some of the other researchers at TTI and looking at you know, where to place driveway locations um, using the same set of Ouija data. I don't know, Mahin, if you have any others that you wanted to speak about. Yeah, there are a lot of projects that we can do with Ouija data. For example, the thing that we are uh, actually doing right now is um, capturing passing maneuver from the data. For example, when uh, one vehicle wants to uh, do the passing maneuver from the start to the end and also uh, creating a speed profile for different area of Texas roads. Um, and um, another one was uh, capturing turning maneuver that we use actually in the NICER project. Uh, these are what comes to my mind right now. 
Great, thank you so much. It doesn't look like we have any other um, questions at the moment, um, but you have received the contact information for all three of our presenters. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free uh, to reach out to um, each of them or, or as a group, and they will be um, willing to answer those questions. Um, so on behalf of NICER, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, please um, stay connected to the NICER website for all of our upcoming webinars um, and sign up for a subscription uh, for our, our newsletters. I am going to open up the evaluation uh, for each of you. If you could take a few moments to complete the evaluation as a feedback provided is not only important to the NICER webcast series, uh, but also to our presenters today. So on behalf of NICER, thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you all real soon. Bye everybody.